And so here's yet another UCSC professor's perspective on their path to open source hardware. Um, and thanks for the introduction. So first, I want to uh, give a brief announcement. There's a press release um, that OpenRAM has actually been acquired by a private company. Um, it's now going to be closed source moving forward. I can't comment any further than the press release. I'm under NDA with a new private company. Um, so you can just read this. <laughs> so it definitely won't be about OpenRAM. Actually, this is generated by ChatGPT. So <laughs> it was actually pretty accurate. The only mistake it made was it said I was at Berkeley. Or was at, <laughs> so um, I corrected that, though. So. But other than that, everything is directly from ChatGPT. So. Anyways, no one's done an April Fool's yet. So, OK. Um, so my hypothesis about open source is it's actually more related to hairstyle than anything else. OK? Um, I, or this, maybe this could also be the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, so here's me as you know, a, a kid, 17-year-old, mullet, braces. Um, I was getting into be a user of Linux then. This is kind of mid-late 90s, mid-90s. Um, you know, really excited about stuff. Um, you know, as I got older in school and grad school, the hair got longer. You know, I would say at this point I became kind of a power user of Linux. I was a tinkerer, a little bit of a bug reporter, but I didn't really consider myself as you know a contributor. Um, I was more of a curious person playing with stuff. Um, this kind of was all through um, undergrad. You know, and then now I'm, I kind of consider myself. Um, the hair moved from my head to my beard at one point, and I've since lost it. Now I think, like to think of myself as a contributor, but also a mentor and a researcher and so on. And I put a caveat down here. If, if you don't have hair, this still applies. You just have to wear a wizard hat. Um, because I added the term up on the top of open sorcery, which I think Dustin, our colleague that missed his talk, I don't know if he coined it, but I like the term. And I think we should uh, stick with that. So open sorcery. Now, you know, my, my experience with open source started as kind of that, that ugly kid as a user. Um, you know, as more of a, 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 an issue with open information rather than open source. So it wasn't necessarily the source code itself, but just getting access to things. Um, you know, I kind of grew up lower middle class, didn't have a lot of computer stuff. I pieced together computers from e-waste at my dad's work. He'd bring home something, he'd be like, it might work. You know, the IT people threw it out. I'd have to figure out what it was, how, to, how it works. No manuals. You can't just download a PDF online at that time. So a bit of it was trying to figure that stuff out. And, you know, and of course, I didn't have a Windows license, so I started using Linux as soon as I knew about it. And then getting that hardware that you would randomly find to work in Linux was always a challenge. And what I initially found was, you know, this was still kind of pre-internet, but you could use dial-up, and I would basically found um, IRC and, and Usenet, and kind of these communities of like-minded people that were very similar to BBSs that we had before that, but BBSs weren't necessarily technical. And you could find technical communities within these that could help with some of those things. And I think this era was really an important one for me to kind of understand um, the importance of not only um, documentation, but just knowledge in general. And I think that's part of what open source is. It's open information. You know, and that kind of gave way to college, where I consider this more, I still wasn't a contributor or a developer, but it, it was more of a, a playground for me at that point, where I had all these things. I had more hardware, uh, dual 19-inch CRT dis art displays under Linux, right? Getting stuff like that to work in kind of the late 90s was a pain. Who's ever uh, configured an X11 mode line? Yeah, you don't have to do that stuff anymore. But, you know, a few people. So, you know, that type of stuff was, you know, always, you had to look at the code, figure out what was going on, just to get your display to work, right? Um, but yeah, also doing other fun projects based on open source things. We do large language models now, but I remember doing a plugin for ICQ with Eliza, where when I was away, it would start talking to people just randomly with responses. You know, are you sure about that? Are you feeling that? What are you feeling? It's a horrible language model, right? But it's one of the early ones that was open source. And you could do projects with that just for fun. Um, so I did a lot of things, you know, early web stuff. 
And you know, generally getting things to run on hardware was always just an experience. Um, that was kind of that era. The kind of turning point came for me with actually a desire to watch um, more Seinfeld and Simpsons. And part of this was actually um, is before streaming too, um, and trying to implement TV capture to actually record episodes. You know, who would want to use a v VCR, right? When you have a computer and you want digitized versions of these things. You know, and so one of the early experiences I had with trying to commit patches was with the ATI All in Wonder cards and trying to get them to work to actually, the drivers were poorly supported in Linux and trying to actually piece together knowledge from the internet, you know, in, in places and put together something that would work. And, you know, this is kind of before we have kind of these standard GitHub, you know, managing software and stuff. So contributing things back was very hard then. You know, even the Linux kernel was, you know, switching between different um, revision management systems and stuff. But yeah, actually modifying the kernel to get things to work. And that was kind of the, the motivation was extrinsic. You know, I wanted to watch more cartoons and shows. But it was also fun. Now, the first time I actually saw the impact was with a project I did in um, the first year of grad school. And uh, people see my name and they often see it associated with this, my bench. This is actually a set of benchmarks that I did as a class project in, as Scott said, like less than four weeks. You know, those are the significant things. This didn't necessarily follow good open source practices, but it was open source. And what I did was I, I collected a set of applications and embedded benchmarks because the only benchmarks available for architecture were really like the spec benchmarks at the time. But I was really working on tiny microcontrollers, 8-bit microcontrollers, serial microcontrollers. And the spec benchmarks were too overwhelming for even those. So we wanted a set of benchmarks that were open source, but also represented that type of application. And we put these together. I worked with Todd Austin and Trevor Mudge and a bunch of pretty famous architecture people to do this. And it had a huge impact. You know, within the first couple of years, it was like hundreds of citations. And now it's been like almost 5,000 citations, which just shows that something very simple can have a huge impact. And I think I kind of understood this when, after we immediately published this, these benchmarks, we actually got a cease and desist letter from another commercial or proprietary embedded benchmark system. I'm not allowed to say who, it's, who it is because I can't compare with that. But um, you know, we knew that we were scaring people right, that by having things be freely available. Now, along the same time, I'm like, OK, I was working with other hardware people. And I'm like, well, let's do more with hardware and open stuff. We had another project called UMIPS. This is trying to be a, a kind of a competitor or a companion to open cores, right, that uh, some people in here have done. But we were focusing really on more mixed signal and analog and kind of the other stuff. And, you know, we released this project. And in the 20 some years, it's gotten six citations. So no impact. Now, what was the difference between the two projects? Well, we didn't actually open up the UMIPS IP repository. You know, there were a bunch of, you had to email us to sign a license with the university. Um, we actually didn't even really specify a license for the whole thing. Um, it relied on proprietary PDKs, which we know are a big barrier. Proprietary tools, you had to have licenses for the commercial tools to even use it, and the certain versions of the tools. And at that time, you even had to have certain Unix systems, because a lot of the tools would only run on Sun OS, for example. So you couldn't even use a Linux system. And we had poor documentation. And so basically, nobody else could use it. Now, I'm not saying MyBench followed good practices. And it didn't. Um, it was open source. But, and it's not been maintained much. But it was available. And I think that's the key thing. But this project just died, right? Now, I kind of, my next big project is OpenRAM, which I will have the one slide about it, even though the NDA allows me to talk about this one slide. Um, you know, I always intended for this to kind of it's kind of in that same sp a span of you know UMIPS, where it's not dealing with standard digital stuff. So it's kind of harder, where you have to deal with PDKs and you know spice models and things like that that are not as available usually. And I've always intended it to be kind of a bit of both. You know, not only support the open source tools, but also proprietary tools if people need them, um, and also to support proprietary and now open source technologies. Um, that's an important thing. And you know, I've had. There's been many memory compilers in the past, but the key about this was to make it such that you know 
portions of it can be reused so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. And that's an important thing. It's not going to solve the memory compilation problem for everybody, but it can be utilized to support most people. So what have I learned from OpenRAM? And this is where I kind of get into just a little bit of advice. One of the biggest problems is the number of people in our community. Um, if you think about Linux, how many users of operating systems are there? Many. Everyone has a phone with Android and whatever. Many. How many software developers are there? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands, millions. How many chip designers are there? 10,000? I don't know. Not many. Not many at all. So how many people actually do chip design? It's a challenging problem. You know, open PDKs, this is a great move forward with providing access, but it's still a problem because the, the levels of abstraction between hardware and software have grown so much that it's very hard to become an expert in all of those areas and even know what's going on in all of them. And we have to remember that as a community and work together to kind of get around that. So what we need to do is you know, a couple things. We need to make sure to submit bug reports for people, help people with recreating things, release code, not duplicate projects when we have existing things out there that can do, that can do what we want. You know, I know we talked about some cases for duplication, for learning and things like that, but you know, we need to first look at reuse um, when, we, when we do projects, especially when there's a small number of users. You know, it doesn't make sense to fork a project when there's only five users of a project. Just use the same one. Now, another thing I just saw the other day, so my bench, I worked on that with Todd Austin, a professor at Michigan that um, came out with SimpleScaler, one of the original you know, architecture simulators. And that's 30 years old as of the other day. And that had 7,000 citations. And my bench was the first um, project to use SimpleScaler ARM when it came out, the new ISA that they had that back, way back then. And an interesting comment from him was he, he commented that all of the feedback he had over the years on SimpleScaler has only been negative. And you know, kind of the idea of, you know, with open source projects, all we tend to see are bugs or people things that people don't like, right? So it's important to think about this with open source. You want to stay positive and also think, remember that these are ways to improve your project. That, that's important to think about. So not to get dismayed and kind of to move forward in a constructive way. Now, another way we can do things to help is we have to all think about um, mentoring others in our community. Like, look at this room. The diversity in our field is horrible, right? If you look at software it's, in CS, it's still bad. We're like 10x worse than that in hardware. And we need to get around that by basically being inclusive and helping other people um, with, in the area. Now, part of this is the mentorship can't be left to a few people. That doesn't scale. You know, it can't just be a few professors that mentor students. It has to be the community itself that mentors people and not in formal ways. Informal mentorship is also useful through online medium. You know, think back to when I got started, IRC and Usenet. I didn't know who any of those people were, but they were mentoring me to get where I am today. So we have to rem remember that a lot of this online communication me mechanisms, whether it's Slack, IRC, Discord, these are opportunities for all of us to help other people and grow our community. So, you know, be accepting of people, you know, be aware of microaggressions, you know, don't just be like, ah, go read the manual. I know that's a joke to read the manual, but just, it's not very welcoming to people if you just say that. And so can you answer questions, even if they're bad questions on an online medium, perhaps you can help someone phrase a question in a better way. And that's a good form of mentorship. You know, how do you ask a question to get a good answer? That's actually one of the things I most often talk to my grad students about is how do you get support in open source? And the way is to ask a good question, to make it easy for someone to answer you and to, you know, to be specific in what you want, not just how do I do X? You know, it's like, I've tried to do this. I get stuck on this part. What do I do next? Is there more information? You know, coaching people along that might not know is important to help them to become a contributor and become part of our small community. So the mentorship thing we should all think about more. And the other thing along with that is to remember that you know, contributions come in all sizes, in all shapes and sizes. You know, whether someone at the, uh, you know, don't, first of all, as a 
a maintainer of an open source, respect other people's contributions, even if they're fixing typos in your documentation. That's valuable. Similarly, if you have someone that is a, f you want to make sure that people aren't afraid to contribute, even tiny things like typos in documentation. You know, encouraging people to do that to get them familiar with the process is important, and mentoring them to do that is is good because these people will then grow to be valuable contributors later as they grow, as they learn. You know, and then can you leverage you know other people's knowledge that you might not have? You know, building CIs, we know that's really important. Documentation, we have an international community, and people have better and worse language skills. You know, grammar, just if someone does a tutorial and doesn't understand it and they ask a question, see if you can help them coach to improve the documentation, right? That might, that, it's a good contribution for them to start with. Um, you know, can you debug things? Can you make a graphic? You know, all these things are important. Then finally, you know, we're all here, but participate. Um, this is a plug for WOSET, which um, is another conference that Jose and I have run for three years now. Um, WOSET is open source EDA technologies. It's remaining a virtual conference. I think there's a number of in-person uh, workshops and so on. We're keeping it virtual because I think the participation we've got from throughout the world has been pretty amazing during COVID. Um, it's still co-sponsored by ICCAD, but I've, they've wanted to charge $50 or something every year and I keep saying, no, we'll just pull out and not work with you. But they, they would like to have the publicity of us being involved, I guess. And so we're still associated with them. And we may have an in-person mixer at ICCAD, though, in San Francisco this year. We'll see. So have a virtual workshop and then kind of get together and have coffee or something. Now, I'm also going to ask here for um, help organizing. You know, part of that mentorship and community is we need people to be involved, you know, besides just Jose and I and a couple PC members. And Jonathan, you know, you helped out as well. And a number of other people did too. But we, we need to grow that community to um, make it um, more successful. I think this can be improved more beyond the last couple of years. So, you know, kind of a smattering of ideas um, and my experiences. So um, I'll open up for questions. <laughs> and if people want the press release, I'll keep that up. Hello, <clears throat> thank you for the talk. Uh, good luck on the, with the new venture. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I was curious, so I see with open source <clears throat> that there there's often a happening of people being taken for granted. Mm -hmm. So if you're a contributor and people complain with bu uh, bugs in your software, so is that complaint taking you for granted? I see very a lot of open source contributors uh, frustrated by that. But if you look at from the other uh, point of view, mm -hmm. somebody actually used your software and wanted to notify you that there is a bug. Some are less polite than others, but still they used it and they actually took their time and reported the bug. So I see a lot of yeah. uh, like, people taking uh, for granted in uh, both yeah. ways. And I wanted to get your uh, I idea how to improve that. Yeah, no, that's a very good comment. Yeah, I've been on both ends of that, right? And I think all of us have. Um, and we have to remember that, yeah, all of this stuff, for the most part, is volunteer, right? <laughs> not not a lot of people get paid to do full-time open source, or to use it or to um, develop it. So I don't know, I think it's a... It's been a problem ever since you know the original IRC and Usenet, where you don't have kind of this face-to-face -face interaction with people to say, "Oh, I'm trying to use your thing, and there's a problem," and you lose the personality in those conversations, which is part of the issue. So I haven't been on Discord. I don't know if Discord is any any good with that, but you actually can talk to people. Um, maybe that's something we need to start doing: is having more like voice chat or more, you know. Looking at someone face to face is kind of brings the humanity back into things. Maybe that's something. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That, other than that, that's a, it's definitely a thing. And I think spanning also different languages and customs as well. You, know, you might have someone that's from a very, comes off as abrasive that's just from a culture that that's more accepting. Or they're just not good at English. Or, or you're just misunderstanding them. So. I think 
being patient and accepting is something that we all have to just practice and remember as part of being this broader community to make it good. I don't know. It doesn't really answer the question, but it's more of a call to arms, right? So, yeah. So, uh, this is a question, uh, but uh, I think it was a great talk, uh, and I really can't stress enough what you said that you need to be kind to newcomers. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not have been here today if it wasn't that people were very, very patient with me uh, when I first entered this field and just tried to help me. Uh, and that's super important. Yeah. That's why I stress like fixing typos. Like help someone understand how to submit a PR with typos. You know, getting them through that first step is important. You know, and if, if they get stuck on a tutorial, be like, can you, you know, rewrite that paragraph to fix what you had a problem with? Like, kind of try to challenge them with an assignment in a way. Because you know, a lot of these people are students that want to help, or you're, you're newcomers that want to help, but they don't know how. That's also what I found very interesting in very later, for example, Wilson Snyder always asks people like, how can I help you fixing your problem? Like, it's, mm -hmm. like with every report, he just like tries to help them fixing it. And I think he invests more time helping people to fix stuff than yeah. he would have fixed it himself immediately, right? Yeah. But I think it's very efficient in the end because he gets people that might be interested to fix more things, right? I think yeah. that's a good approach to actually invest into people that might be contributors in the future. Yeah, and I think you know, as faculty, Jose mentioned getting going through your career and becoming a senior faculty, you start to realize that working with students, it's not always most productive to work with students. You're doing it to improve them, yeah. and you would possibly be more efficient just doing it on your own, but that's not the point of it. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. One of the other great uh, places for this is that in uh, you know Fossey Foundation, we're members of uh, Google Summer of Code again this year, and um, this is something we keep doing, and we're always looking for mentors from all variety of projects because we just act as an umbrella organization and we want to help you get people participate in your projects and help you act as mentors for those projects and i know yeah. that at santa cruz you also have some yeah. uh, special systems for us maybe you can tell yeah we have the open source research experience osre which is also a google summer of code um, site and we've had a number of projects on open road and and um i had a project on open La open ram last year and yeah, there's a number of projects there. The only requirement for the that one is you have to have an affiliated UC faculty member involved at any campus. And there's a lot of us. There's a lot. There's yeah. There's many of us. So. <laughs> yeah, and then I think there's also a, a reproducibility focused uh, project opportunity this summer as well. Yeah, that those are all kind of related. They're run by the same office at Santa Cruz, and so we have a number of projects that are also not OS Google Summer of Code, but similar in scope. So if any of you are looking for a project, you can also check those. Yeah, out. <laughs> yeah. Send send me some information if you want to have questions. MRG at UCSC. All right. Well, I guess we'll stop uh, this one here, and we've got uh, Jerry Zhao from Berkeley up next. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Thank you.